Hello, John. Good evening. Excited. The DDK. Good evening. So good to see you. Honestly, a real, real joy. Thank you for joining in. And I hope Thank you're you well. Anticipation has been so high to have you on board this awesome. evening. So what's been the highlight awesome, of this season awesome. for you? Um, the highlights of this season, wow, this is uh, it's something I have to think about. But um, yeah, I'm just I'm just excited to be alive in this era, right? I think that you know, a friend of mine was asking me, you know, what I would have done or what career path I would have chosen if I was born like in the 18th century, and I couldn't picture it. Like, what yeah. what would I do? <laughs> what would I do? I don't know what I would do. I'll probably, I don't know. Maybe I would have been a colonial master. I don't know. But But, you know, just being alive in this era where there are so many tools to express our talents and our gifts, I just feel so blessed. Like I can have a message in my heart and with a few clicks or with a few taps on my phone, it's able to reach thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and yes. catalyze a lot of change in people's hearts and minds. I think that is priceless. And it's I priceless. believe that for those of us who are born in this era, we should not get over familiar with this capacity, with this power, mm. that our parents, just one generation above us, could not even experience. I mean, yes. come think about it. Even we were born in a time where there was no internet. We My were God. living, yeah, we lived My in a time God. where there were no mobile phones where you had to hope that the person you were calling was at home, remember? Yes. <laughs> so, you know, but sometimes it's so easy to forget that we actually lived that. <laughs> and here we are, social media is here. There's online marketing, there, there's, there, there, there's Instagram, there's live streaming. I mean, you and I can be having this conversation together and it's being streamed yes. to people all over the world. It's, it's bonkers. And every day I approach it oh, with the eyes of fascination of someone who just discovered it today. So it, it, it makes me excited every single time, every time. Oh, powerful. Thank you for reawakening my gratitude because I have forgotten that I lived in a time that you just described, mm. you know. So, yeah, that gratitude is important. That awe is also is, is important and it just keeps making you unravel possibilities because we're not taking it for granted. Powerful. Yes. Yes. Powerful. So thank you, you for joining us this evening. Yes. At I would like to please, I would like to please just steal um, two minutes or a minute and a half yes. so that I can do yes. two things. I want to just share this broadcast as we are live with my Facebook okay. group and then my Telegram awesome. channels. That will take about, about okay. 60 seconds to do. <laughs> okay. You want me to take okay. you out of the screen? And no, 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 I can back. be on, but, but I, 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 I can be on if you can just you know, say something okay. to your people in the meantime. Okay, excellent. So, yeah. I mean, uh, people are here and the numbers will keep growing. And then we have such, a, such an excited um, replay viewing audience as well. Just, uh, you know, such a delight to have everyone in this evening. Thank you for the path that you've chosen to take. It's the path of the visionary life. The choices you're making, you know, don't just count for you. They count for a generation. They count for communities. They count for cities, countries, continents, you see. So thank you, every single one, joining in on the Pivot Conversation. And tonight, we're really just looking at how you can amplify and multiply your value in the 21st century as a visionary leveraging community. Um, so I believe that is going to be an exciting conversation uh, with Father J.O. He is dearly beloved. He's got a huge community of, you know, uh, visionary leaders, entrepreneurs, change makers, doing great things across the world. So I believe that he's got a lot of insights that he will bring forth today that you can use as you move forward. Okay, ahead of when we fully dive in um, with the questions that we have for J.O., tell me where you are streaming from and tell me what describes the ideal future you're striving for. Where are you streaming from? 
and tell me the ideal future you're striving for. Paint that for me and be like, hey, DDK, this is what I want to see happen in the world. This is why I wake up. This is why I do the work that I do. And let us have that conversation. So where are you joining us from tonight? I am in Lagos, Nigeria at the moment. Um, where are you joining us from? And describe your ideal future. Anyone who wants to take that on, I'll be excited to hear from you. Why are you doing this work that you're doing? Oh, is he a reverend father? No, he's a father of, uh, of, of thought. He's a father of thought and is a father of knowledge, of the knowledge uh, you know, era or whatever you want to call that. Yeah, so he's a knowledge leader. And you know, he's, he's distributed life-changing counsel to so many hundreds of thousands of people that they actually call him Father J.O. So that's his own kind of father, but he's revered. Yeah, if it, if it counts as something. <laughs> Joining it from Manchester in the UK, Abuja, Lagos, Nigeria, Lagos, Nigeria, you are welcome. Thank you for joining in this evening. What else do we have on board? We've got someone from Germany, Ottawa, in Canada. You are welcome, Salome. Thank you for joining us. We've got Adibala from Nevada in the U.S., my sister. You're welcome. We've got Soro from Landmark University in Quara State. Now, that one is exciting for me. Well done. And you go grab all your friends and your siblings, your contemporaries, Drop the link on the WhatsApp groups that you belong and, you know, put it on the family group as well. Share with your fellow visionaries. Let everybody know that we are live. And Atilola is in from Lagos, Nigeria. This is going to be exciting. You are welcome. Chisum from Anambra, Nigeria. Comfort Adelu from Lagos. Odunola from Abuja. Adedoni from Texas. Olubumi from Maryland in the U.S. Excited to have you, Dowu from Laurel, MD, U.S. You are welcome, Timmy Tokwe from South Africa, Idara from Akwaibom, Precious from Anabra. Thank you for joining us. And Marka from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Excited to welcome you, Anyi from Cameroon, and Uluapo. Good to have you from Lagos. Uh, we've got Faith from Abuja, Ian from Calabar, Solomon King from Gombe. Welcome to every one of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We've got our friends from the U.S., from Salvador and Brazil, from Port Harcourt, from River State. Uh, J.O., did something just stay in your heart when you saw Salvador, Brazil? Yes. <laughs> My yeah, second country. I love Brazil. Exactly, the second country. Exciting. Yes. Uh, welcome to everyone. I'm happy to take one, two, three people who want to share with me tonight. Okay, I already have one from Amaka. Share with me your ideal future. Why are you doing the work you're doing? What do you hope, uh, what kind of change do you hope you can create in the world? Amaka says, I'm eagerly looking forward to a future when families are strong, thriving, fulfilling God's purpose and excelling on earth. The 360 degrees teacher says, I desire Nigeria or Nigerian educational system with relevant curriculum that helps learners develop practical skills and values that position them for relevance. Thank you, you, and that is so powerful. Uh, it also says the future I envision is wholesome movie, music, and animation content for children and families. Moses says, I want to raise a generation of growth and purpose-inclined minds. Just so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing with me what you're working on and what you're looking toward. And let me tell you, like we always say, top three things you must never forget. The first is that your vision is valid. Even if it's just still a burden, a problem you want to solve, an ideal future you want to create, and you don't have the roadmap, the, you don't have the pro a project plan, you don't know anyone who could support you right now, that vision in your heart to create change in the world is valid. The second thing that you must never forget is you actually are the man for the job. You're the woman for the job. If it burns in your heart, it's because you have a role to play. And it's then important to begin to say, how do I use an accurate understanding of my identity, my giftings, my heritage, my unique potential, and my destiny DNA to unlock the answers I need for the vision in my heart? You see, so if, if it burns in your heart, it's because there's something you can do about it. So you're the woman for the job. You're the man for the job. You've got this destiny DNA 
that can truly help you uh, create that solution for the world. But you have to get educated for it. And that's the third important thing that I'd like you, in fact, is why you're here. And I'm so proud of you. You have to get educated for your vision. You have to get the thinking, the tools, the thrust. Do you see if there is a whole toolkit that helps you really uh, merge visionary excellence with the mastery of genius and helps you connect with your the right audience, create the right community for your vision? And that's why we're here. That's what we're doing with Visionary Compass Accelerator Program. You see as a high tier uh, coaching and mentorship system that provides you this robust toolkit to really be able to unlock your vision, whatever level you are, whether you're starting at uh, just clarifying it or going to launch it or building an institution or scaling, you see. And John Obidi is in the house, is a new media consultant, an international speaker and personal development trainer. John is a highly skilled, compelling, visionary, and phenomenal resource person, bringing pra practical intelligence and transferable solutions to both the workplace and the marketplace as a whole. And he's doing so in the most innovative and unconventional ways, unlocking admiration, gratitude from clients and industry stakeholders everywhere. In 2018, John was voted among Avans Media's 100, 100 most influential young Nigerians coming in, coming in second in the final rankings. In 2018, December, he won the Future Awards Africa Prize for New Media. Powerful. 2018, when people were just like eating ice cream and all of that, John was already doing epic stuff. 2020, he was voted among the 100, 100 most influential young Africans. Wow. He's a leading consultant on online digital marketing in Africa and is the founder of Head Start Africa community. Guys, listen, <laughs> of over 180,000 business and career professionals as a thought leader in personal development, leadership, and online marketing, John's blog, podcast, webinars, workshops, masterclasses, conferences, and speaking engagements are highly acclaimed to be practical, disruptive, paradigm shifting, forward looking and highly progressive. He has served as a keynote speaker in Brazil, UAE, Ghana, Zambia, and Nigeria. He's available as keynote speaker and panelist for conferences, workshops, and knowledge sharing platforms. Everybody all across the continent and around the world, please welcome <laughs> with me, John Obidi. <laughs> Excited thank to you. Have you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I was I was thinking uh, there's Rwanda too, but maybe they're not updated my bio, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I thought that we like uh he's actually been to other countries. So there's Rwanda in there. We're putting it there yeah. because by the way, yeah. uh, Rwanda is one of my favorite countries. Uh Lovely. the president was not here that, but it's one of my favorite countries. Lovely. It's one of my favorite African countries. Yeah. Let by this time say, next month, I'll be yes. there again. You'll be back there. Yes, this time next month. <laughs> well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you for thank the you. great contributions you're making. And thank, thank you. you on a personal level, John, for the help you've offered me, the counsel you've given me, the game-shaping insights that my set pleasure. me on fire about two years ago. And it, it definitely just shifted my results, shifted my results in very epic thank ways. You. And thank I'm you. so good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. So Always much. a pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm grateful. So let's start off about uh, what it means to you to be a direct leader for almost 200,000 people who look up to you for thought leadership, for guidance, for uh, disruptive insights, for the business, the careers, their personal life. Does it come with this? Do you sometimes feel like, oh, my God, there are too many people looking up to me. I cannot afford to fail. Or, yeah, how do you steal what that? sense of responsibility and what kind of um what kind of sense of fulfillment might come from knowing how you're directly impacting because this 180,000 guys are those that are plugged in directly to your community there's a lot more who listen to you and who get transformed by that so how does that feel really almost 200,000 people well you know, I don't know if anyone here has seen the, the recent Kanye West documentary called Genius. 
right? Mm. There, there's this scene in that documentary where Kanye's mother was um, advising him and tell, you know, giving him a, a pep talk. And she said something. She, there's a quote she said that I remember. She said, the, the giant looks in the mirror and sees nothing. That was so deep. I never forgot that. The giant is so everyone else is everyone else around the giant are like, wow, he's or she is this or is that. But when you yourself look in the mirror, it's just it's nothing. It's just you. Right. So I I've I've hardly ever seen it as some as a matter of fact, I'll I'll tell you why I actually started. I started this from a from a partly from a place of annoyance. At the time I started my online community facebook was a dumping ground for all kinds of crap and i hated it so much i i i'm a trained computer um scientist so i was raised to think very logically and i realized that my generation did not know how to think it was mm. a yes it was, it's a terrible mm. problem and 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 guess what when people look at nigeria especially first world countries look at nigeria and say wow they have the largest young population. Hmm. That is not exactly a bragging right. Wow. It's not a bragging right because if a country, Nigeria, namely, has the largest young population, I don't know what the numbers are, hundreds of millions, but they don't know how to think, they can easily be weaponized by any foreign agent that understands how to weaponize people who don't know how to think. Wow. The only time our population can work to our advantage is if our people are educated and know how to use their minds. So good. If you do not know how to, I mean, look, there's a lot of metaphors so for this in the Bible. There's a lot of metaphors in the Bible. When Jesus Christ cast out a demon from, I mean, thank God most of our people here are faith-based, so people will connect here. When Jesus Christ cast out a demon from someone, and he was teaching the disciples that, look, you know, when you cast out a demon from somebody, you know, you can't just leave that person empty. Otherwise, seven more powerful demons will take over. You see, those demons don't have to be physical demons okay. that have teeth and claws. Those demons can be ideologies. Yes. Ideologies are the demons of the 21st century. And for people who have not been taught to guard their mind or their hearts with all diligence, they don't have the tools, critical thinking tools, with which to, to guard their minds. There will be a dumping ground for these seven stronger demons that they did not come yes. from the ether. They're not come from anywhere. These demons are strategies. You know, most people don't understand why Donald Trump, um, I think before he left, was trying to ban TikTok. Donald Trump understood this, that first of all, in China, right, China does not allow Google, doesn't allow Twitter, doesn't allow Facebook. They have theirs. They're like, if anybody's going to indoctrinate our citizens, it's going to be us, not a foreign nation. So good. Donald, yeah. Donald Trump said, that, oh, so why is a Chinese app the most popular thing in America? If anybody's going to indoctrinate our people, it will not be China. It will be us. Now, guess what? Some people did some studies and they realized that the thing that trends on Chinese, because don't forget, TikTok is owned by ByteDance, the yes. Chinese company. TikTok US and TikTok China are both owned by ByteDance. Even though now Donald Trump forced them to sell the US entity to a US company. All right. But I'm just saying before that, you know, sell off, they were owned by, it was all Chinese. Now, someone realized that the things that trended on the Chinese version of TikTok was different from the things that trended on the US version of TikTok. Follow me. The US version of TikTok, what was trending? Girls twerking. Mm. Doing the dumbest things ever. Because the algorithm was, was rewarding the dumbest behavior. Because how do you take down the most powerful nation on earth? How? Ideologies. Wow. You have to convince young people that they can become famous being dumb. But guess what was what they were rewarding with their algorithm in Chinese TikTok? Science, engineering, sports, ingenuity. So when Chinese kids oh. see that the thing that is trending, getting millions of views, 
is one kid who built a windmill. They were like, ah, I want to do that too. And that influences them, peer pressure. They want to get famous too for doing scientific stuff. They realize they're like, oh my goodness, these people are going to run the world. It is only in, and so that's why Donald, what Donald Trump saw and said, you know what? No, if anyone's going no. to tweak the algorithm, let it be us that will decide what our people are going to think. For good or for evil, let us be, let us have, have agency over that. So he did whatever he did, and then they had to sell off to an American company. I don't know if you heard recently, but the DOJ, you know, or the FBI asked that TikTok, I think it was like this past week, asked that they remove TikTok from the U.S. app store because they just realized that even though TikTok China had sold the U.S. version to, to the United States, they left some kind of a back door by which yes. they were able to access data. It came That's up in the, the news recently. Control. Yes. Right. So this is how this is being used in this. But, but you see, you see how these countries are playing the politics. It is only in Nigeria that any foreign entity can just dump stuff. And because people do not understand how the mind works, see, you are being controlled by people who know you more than you know yourself. Yes. They know what makes you happy. They know what makes you sad. They know what incentivizes you. They know what motivates you. And so people in our generation need to learn how to think. Otherwise, we are just agents in the hands of some other foreign power. So this is what I saw way back when I started in like 2016. And I went on, I saw Facebook, my, my country people were just sharing jokes all sort of weird memes. And I said, I want to create a community that will be known for education, that will be known for civility. Back then on Facebook, everybody was being all savage and it was the in thing to be yes. savage and rude. Yes, I remember you that know, time. Yes. What, that was what Facebook was known for. I said, I'm going to create this oasis where people who have sense can come in and be like, okay, I can feel safe to be myself here. That is to be <sighs> civilized, to be knowledgeable, to be smart, I can actually get a lot of traction for being smart on this community. Like outside this community, everybody can be going crazy. But inside here, I can write something smart and be appreciated for it by hundreds and thousands of people. And that's why I created that. And so when I created it, I, it was like a military dictatorship because people were not used to that kind yes. of environment before. So they would come in, somebody post something and someone will come and act like they are used to acting outside of the community and they would make some kind of joke that I know will affect that person's confidence. And I'll leave a comment there saying, I expect your apology in the next 30 minutes or you are banned for life. And, ev and it. it's not just for the person who committed, but everybody else and ev all other yes. onlookers are watching. I'm like, eh? Okay. Nah, I think it's bluffing, Jerry. You're not going to follow through. Don't you want to grow your community? You want to chase everybody away? I said you will be banned for life. The person has to now think and do their cost-benefit an analysis. And I'm like, okay, I, I was just joking. Now. I was just, nobody said, uh -huh, we don't joke like that here. Yes. <laughs> we don't joke like that. And over time, that yeah, and over time, it began to grow slowly. It took one year to get to our first 5,000 members. One year. But after that one year... We began to multiply. It just began to take off. It began to take off. I remember when um, in, I started the group in in January on January twenty seventh or so, twenty sixteen. I think like two weeks later, we had about seven hundred members. And I was speaking at Poise um, Finishing School. I think about community or something. And they were introducing me as Yolobidi, who has a community of over seven hundred members. And I was and they were clapping. And in my mind, I was like seven hundred and five. It's not easy. Five, seven hundred ah! and five. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, yeah. But I was just so focused on doing that. You know, and, and, and also, you see, it's not about just the thing that you're doing. It is about your relationship to the thing. Yes. And I'll explain this. Some people ask me this question, whether jazz actually works. And my, question, my answer to that is like, yes and no. You see, when a, when a babalawo or whatever tells a man that, look, if you do this, 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 this sacrifice, you are going to be very rich. It's not about the sacrifice itself. It's the belief in him. After he has done that thing, he actually believes that, he believes that guy 100%. And the confidence with which he engages the world, he's not expecting a no, because he actually believes that there are spirits around <sighs> aiding him. It's not this, it's the, whether there are spirits or not, it's, not, it's his relationship to that thing he has just done. 
And so a confidence he never had before is the confidence that he never had before, that he now has because of now. what he thinks is aiding him. That's what actually gives him success. Mm. So in my case, in my case, I was radicalized by one thing I read in the Bible. You know, when Jesus Christ started his ministry, he first came to the temple and asked for the scroll to be handed over to him. And he began to read one verse from the, from the book of Isaiah, you know. And I don't know why. I don't know why, where that thing came from. I don't know what made me think it was. Why well, I believe that that thing was written about me. Was it true? Was it false? I don't know. But the important is that I just believed it was written about me. When he said, the spirit of, of the Lord is upon me to yes. give sight to the blind. That was, I believed that was about me. So I did, I came to this thing with a kind of authority and a kind of boldness that I was fully convinced about what I was doing. All the actions that I was taking, I wasn't going on television because it's the thing to do. I said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to give sight to the blind. When I'm about to speak to people, they're about to be illuminated. I'm like, oh, I never yes. saw it this way before. Well, I really believed it. I was so radicalized. I used to fast. <laughs> it was crazy. No, see, I don't fast normally. But then I used to fast before I go out. This I'm like, this is why. I mean, I've cooled down now. Yeah. But then I was, I was a radical. I was a fundamentalist almost. <laughs> But that was the ferociousness with which I attacked this thing that I was doing. So if it wasn't a Facebook community, it would have been a YouTube channel, it would have been an Instagram, it would have been anything. But the point is that it is not the tool in your hand. It is your relationship to the tool. All right. So when we're talking about community here, it's not just about the community. Whatever is in your hand is powerful. But what is your relationship to that thing? You see, one thing about Moses, Moses had to be taught multiple times. All right. Hmm. It's not it's not when he was passing the Red Sea that God have that God first asked him what is in your hand. He has been doing things with that thing, but he had not yet yes. formed a relationship with the gift that he has. He had to be reminded time and time again. The same thing that's right in your hand. You threw it down, it turned to a snake. It's what well, everyone else's snake. The same thing, you know, God. you used you part of the Red Sea. The same thing you used, you struck the rock. The same thing you used. You put you 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 made bitter water sweet. So that your it's your relationship to that thing. Somebody else might hold yes. that thing and not do much, but it's your relationship to that thing. So what is in your hand? All right. And what is your relationship to that thing? Someone says it's written somewhere that the gift of God is given out to every man to do or to profit without. What is your relationship to that gift? It is what you believe your relationship to that thing is. My own was that this my plenty sense was not by accident. That I was born in this time and era was not by accident. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to give sight to the blind. And I met Ola Kuleshorio one day, and he kept on giving me one scripture. Ah, that one added to my arrogance. He said, uh, he, he just gave me one, one verse that said something. He said um, that I'll give you a tongue or something. And a, is it a tongue that... A mouth and an answer. A mouth that and no an man answer. can... And an answer that no one can refute or gainsay. Yes. I said, hey, Lord, <laughs> they, they go here, Ram. <laughs> you know, so that I believe that I just came into this game to give sight to the blind and people were going to be literally liberated by just hearing me speak. And I didn't know what the scale of that movement was going to become. That was not my business at the time, but it was just my goal to figure it out. And so yes. when I was putting down, because I mean, I'll talk about techniques and all that, but when I was putting down money for Facebook ads, I wasn't doing it from a book. I was just thinking, what is the best way? This thing was seen by a thousand people. It's too good to be seen by just a thousand people. I need 10,000 eyes on this thing. What's the best way to achieving that? And I'm fanatically going about it. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Now that got seen by 30,000 people. I need 300,000 eyes on this thing. What do I do? Because for every moment I'm asleep, people are wallowing in darkness. Somebody mm. somewhere is not finding their purpose because they have not made a journey in their life. I thought I'd be like, how people have not met Jonah Bidi? How did they go about their day? How? Like, you've gone through your whole life, you've not heard me speak. I don't, I don't know. How do you guys live? How do you manage? Right? I think about it, I'm like, no, I'm not doing enough. I've got to wake up at night. I've got to prepare this message. I've got to go on YouTube Live. I've got to go on Facebook Live. I want to hold this webinar, this seminar, this summit. People have to hear this guy in their lifetime because that's why I'm here. Right. So, community is just one tool. But what is your relationship to that gift? Amen. John. John. <laughs> What? <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you a question that mm -hmm. is not is not the business of the topic, but I think 
is what people should hear first. Okay. What is the Okay, I don't know if this is from me or DDK. Can you guys hear me? Do I have to leave and come back? Is this from me or from DDK? Okay, I can see myself on my phone, so I think it's DDK. All right, guys, DDK is going to be back. Don't go anywhere. 321 people. Is DJ OBD on the mic of steel? One, two, one, two, check in the microphone. If you can hear the sound of my voice, say, yeah, yeah. All right, I've got the stage now. It's not my stage, this is not my event. This is DDK's event. It's called the Visionary Compass Accelerator Program. Hope I got that right. Now, this is hosted by the legendary. Where is she? She's this way. The legendary DDK. Shout out to everybody from my community and DDK's community. I'm glad you guys are here. Don't go anywhere. DDK is sorting out our internet. These are a few of the third world matters that we are going to punch out. But don't worry. We'll figure it out. Faith Wariri. Yemi CVC. Good to see you. Ava Jacobs. Faith Obalola. Chinaza Favor TV. The usual suspects. My gang members. So good to see you guys. So good to see you guys. I've been giving you guys fire, but the internet on DDK's end is trying to slow us down. But it cannot slow us down. We are going full speed ahead. Okay. Okay. Good to see you guys. Meanwhile, I want you guys to invite your friends. You've been hearing the fire saying, Sabi. Invite your friends, your neighbors, your enemies, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your exes. <laughs> invite everyone who can benefit from this, guys, so that. You don't just chop alone and clean mouths. Amen? Yes. Chibuzo, Awoyemi. So good to see you on here. Sunday, Oko. This is a night school attendees. How on a day? As probably I've not done night school in a while. You guys are trying to repurpose this. Fee Stephen, good to see you. Not that Chichin Lada said that is, is excess and excesses. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. All righty, guys. What do we do? Let's let the choir members at the back lead us in praise and worship while we wait for DDK. Where are the choir members at the back? I mean, is it choir members or praise team? Where's the praise team? Lead us in worship while the technical team is working out DDK's end. All right, lead us in praise and worship. Where's the keyboardist, the drummer? Don't mind me. I grew up in church, so all these things. It just comes out of me. It just comes out of me like that. Israel Mwafo, good to see you guys. Good to see you. Some of you are logging out because you want to save your data. My friend, stay on. You know it not the time or the hour when the son of man, or in this case, when the daughter of man shall appear. So stay on. Go nowhere. Bestie Ati, good to see you. Stephen says that Chinaza should give us our special number. Chinaza, what's your special number? Give us your special number real quick. Moses said him 214. My goodness, I don't know when last I, I saw hymns. That must have been my childhood. Is anybody here old enough to remember ancient and modern book of hymns? If you remember ancient and modern, you are not a child anymore. You should have grandchildren by now. If you know you remember ancient and modern, you should have grandchildren now. And don't ask me to don't ask me to be part of it. I'm, it's not about me; it's about you. Yeah. Children of God, will you shout hallelujah? You guys remember that song? Old time religion churches. Those of you that went to old time religion churches, you know that song, we know you. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll just chill. You guys be looking at my pretty face. 
if all you achieved on this broadcast is to come and look at my face, you made it in life. Just look at me until DDK comes. Tarry for a minute. Tarry for a minute. John, hey, good. <laughs> Hi, John. Good evening. How are you? I am bubbling in the Lord. All right. While well, we wait for DDK, and I love what you said about these um, issue, this issue of internet being one of those issues that in the next couple of years we're going to kick out of the African continent. Um, we did have a couple of questions, and um, I will step in to pose some of those questions to you um, right. while we wait for DDK to come back, um, if that's okay. okay with you. Okay. All right. All right. So welcome once again, everyone. Thank you so much for giving us your time. The first one is right here on the screen. Um, how does one choose a thought leaders, uh, a thought leader who's a thought leaders community to join? Um, so how do you sift through the noise? Something that we shared in, uh, on our social media when we're promoting this event was that we live in a very noisy world. Um, the internet has made it so that so many voices, there's so many voices out there. Anyone can put up anything, um, up online that they wish to. So how do you start to sift through those, um, you know, uh, options that are available to make a choice about who to continue to follow and who to allow to influence your mind as someone who's following thought leaders and reading from people online and following people like you online? You know, I believe that life is life is DIY. It's do it mm. yourself, right? Unfortunately, a lot of people have realized unconsciously that thinking is difficult. It may be difficult, but it is necessary. And so before you find someone to follow, you must have your own ethos. You must have the skills for critical thinking. You know, when we were in university, I don't know how many of you in 100 level had to study a course called philosophy and logic. We all had to do philosophy and logic in 100 level. I don't know how many of you also, you know, did that in whatever university you went to. But in philosophy and logic, there is a topic that we have to pass. It's, it's called truth tables. Mm -hmm. So it's a critical thinking tool through which you can learn to discern what truth is or what truth is likely to be. Okay, people said I do, I did, fantastic. Okay, so you would draw what they call a truth table. And through mm -hmm. that, you'll be able to know, okay, is this true? Is this false? How do I discern whether this statement is true or false? All right? So that discernment has to be there. Uh, Henry Alex, you'll be a course rep. You said GSA 103, even though the course code is fantastic. <laughs> All right? So you have to be able to discern for yourself what truth is. And that needs to be from your own mind, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. King Solomon wrote somewhere, I think in Proverbs or so, he said, a simple mind believes everything they are told. You cannot be a simple mind, especially at a time where there are so many voices. You need to be able to discern. Second Timothy 2.15 says what? Study to show thyself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. You would ask yourself, but it is the word of truth. Why am I still pissing? Why am I? Because there is truth and there is truth. The fact that something is true does not make it the truth. There are two different things. The fact that something is true in itself does not make it truth. For something to be truth, it has to show you the entire picture. And let me explain that to those who have never heard me speak before. To my nine school students, you've, you've heard me teach on this before. To those who have never heard of, or heard of this, you'll be hearing it for the first time. So, for example, if you look at the book of Matthew, right? And I'm only doing this because most of you are, you know, are faith-based, you know, a faith-based audience. Normally, I try to be as neutral as possible, right? So, um... Matthew, I think Matthew, Luke, and John reported it one particular event, but from different angles. And it was that scene where the woman with the alabaster box, you know, came to anoint Jesus' feet with oil and so on. But three people witnessed that event and they reported it differently, Matthew, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. So when Matthew was reporting things from his point of view, he said that when the woman broke the jar and the oil was um, spilled, that the people began to murmur about the cost of the oil. Mm -hmm. But maybe because of where Matthew himself was standing and looking from, he did not know exactly who was talking, so he wrote, the people murmured and said. Now, if you were there at that time, what would have been your opinion on that incident? 
Now, many people will say, oh, they would have sided with Jesus. No, I don't think so. I think that most people would have sided with the rumors and the murmurings. Because that's what they were showing. Is it true that Jesus at that moment appeared wasteful? Yes, of course. Is it true that the oil that was poured on his feet, you know, was worth, you know, a whole year's wages? Yes, of course. But the mm -hmm. fact that something is true does not make it the truth. So how do we arrive at truth? Let's keep on moving. Now, mm -hmm. if you look at the book of John, John was able to dive deeper. John, when reporting it, did not say the people. He said he was able to know who exactly said it. He said it was Judas that was talking. And that would make you the observer like, oh, now that changes things. Judas, what do we know about Judas? So we understand that the bearer of truth must be scrutinized. The fact mm -hmm. that somebody came and told someone that is true does not make it the truth. You've got to be asking yourself, this person that's telling me this thing that is true, what do they stand to gain from my reaction to this true statement? People are not deep. <laughs> and that's why a lot of people, <laughs> you are easily backstabbed. And you come on Instagram, I post on Instagram story, oh, fake friends. Oh, people are backstabbed. No, 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 no. You are just simple-minded, mm. undiscerning. What does this person stand to gain from their anticipated reaction that I would have to this statement? And so John went further and said, John was not, uh, Judas was not saying this because he cared for the poor. He was saying this because he was the bearer of the purse and mm -hmm. he used to help himself from the purse. And now you hear that to be like, oh, wow. That totally changes things mm -hmm. from people were saying to, no, it's one person that was saying, and then this was his intent mm -hmm. and his reason for saying that. That changes things. And now we know the truth. Now, it doesn't even end there. It moves on further. If you look at John and keep on reading, it says that when Judas said that thing, he said it publicly to Jesus, that why would you allow this man with this kind of money? We could have given this thing to the poor. Now, now Jesus, yeah, he, he said that to Jesus publicly. People were there watching. Mm -hmm. Jesus too responded to him publicly and said, guy, what's up with you? I've been alive since you've not done anything like this for me, but this woman's anointing my feet. You know, don't disturb her, right? Now, when Jesus Christ responded, he couldn't take it. He was hurt by that statement. Read the next couple of verses. It was from that confrontation that he walked away from that gathering and went straight to the Pharisees and said, I've had it. Let me show you how to catch this man. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees themselves did not know how to catch Jesus. They were afraid. They didn't know that his, his followers were armed or how many they were. Judas is the one that went from that conversation to be like, you know what? Let's, I'm, I'm ready to hand this guy over. How much do you guys pay me? Yeah. Right? So people need to be able to discern truth. It is when you are able, you, your, your brain is formidable to discern truth, that you can now be able to filter what people are saying. You might, then you can hear somebody, I don't care what a person calls themselves, a pastor or a bishop, or they sound so eloquent, or they have a large congregation, or a large following, you would have the mental capacity to know that, you know what, by trying to discern whether this guy is right or wrong, thunder will not fire me. <laughs> Absolutely. That, oh, if, I, if I question what this guy is saying, thunder will fire me. Ah, touch not my anointed. It means that if I question what, is on, what, what the man of God is saying, thunder will fire me. God will not. No, 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 no. There is no spiritual consequence to curiosity. But you need to have the right mental tools. All right. So it, 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 it's at that point. I know you have to move me on to the next thing. It's at that point. <laughs> you can no, 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 no. Start, please keep going. <laughs> it's at that point. You can now start, okay, who can I follow? All right. Yeah. Whose ideology resonates? All right. Where could this person be? You might say, okay, John Abidi, what he's saying sounds cool, but I think he may have veered off here. I think what he said right here may not be fully tested. Let me keep that in the cooler for a while. You know, mm -hmm. but that spirit of discernment is important. Before you start thinking about, okay, who can I follow online and who can I learn from? But mm -hmm. ultimately, you must trust your mind and trust your intellect. Mm. I love what you shared. Um, I love what you shared. And one thing that's surfacing now as you're speaking is, my goodness, this man is well-read, is very exposed. And I'm sure that within the past couple of years, as you've been building this community, you've also had to pay attention to your own intake, how you build up yourself 
mentally, spiritually, and emotionally, physically, and so on too. How do you manage the time between, you know, expressing all that you do through your community, but making sure that you're also exposing yourself to truth, making sure that you're also exposing yourself to um, um, a variety of information out there in order to be able to prepare uh, for the community, in order to be able to prepare yourself rather for what you share for the community. I'm wondering how you balance that, your expression and your intake to whether it's yeah. time wise and how you filter through yourself, John Abidi, how you yeah. filter through the noise to, to make sure that you're taking in what is most useful to you. Yeah, so one of those things is how I structure my, my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So my lifestyle is designed around leisure. So I have a lot of free time on my hands. Now, whenever people hear me say this thing, they try to start saying, oh, that means he has free time. So <laughs> let me send him a DM. I will not answer you. <laughs> the free time is not so I can be just with you. It's for myself. Oh my I'm talking to all of you now. I, I, I know. I've been, I've been doing this for a while. Whenever I say this, I'm like, ah, so let me now enter. No, the free time is not for me to... You know, if you want my time, you pay for it, amen? Yeah. But that time is for me to be able to read, be able to meditate, be able to have those practices that enable me to be continually and perpetually useful um, to the world. Now, we, we have this saying in personal development that take care of yourself because you cannot give, you cannot pour out of an empty cup. Absolutely. You know? yeah. But that's the lowest level of self-care. At a point of influence, that becomes um, insufficient. You have to extend that to be, so it starts from take care of yourself first because you, kind of, you cannot pour out of an empty cup. Mm -hmm. You've got to extend, when you become a person of influence, you've got to extend that to, and you can only truly give of your overflow. Wow. Really? So that's what I, yes. Wow. So it's not as if, so the first level is, you cannot pour out of an empty cup. So that means if you're half full, uh, you still have something and so you can't pour. You know, no, 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 no. I'm going to be full and then of the overflow, I will mm -hmm. give. So there is never a chance of me experiencing what other people experience, like burnout or mm -hmm. overwhelm. No, because I take time to nourish myself to the level where it is full. Until I am full, I don't have time for anybody. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's like an emergency to you. Or to me. Mm. Because you see this journey, guys. I know when you have followers, hundreds of followers, thousands of followers, it can sometimes get to your head. Not only you, Waka Komo, because when, when you've got bills to pay, it is you. Mm. When you've got your personal needs to handle, it is you. When you've got health challenges, it is you. So when you want to carry on for head, say, ah, I have to do this, speak at five venues in one day. Da -da 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 -da. I don't know who's in competition with you. You've got to take care of yourself first. Because, God forbid, if anything happens to you, see, all that praise and worship that the multitude are giving you, they'll go and copy and paste the same praise and worship to the next person. Mm. It will surprise your spirits how quickly people move on. And it's not a bad thing. It's just a human thing. So, take care of yourself first, all right? And for me, I've had to develop this over the years to prioritize the people. And this is, this is, this is much more personal for those who are trying to build influence. You know, when I first started this, I made some personal mistakes, right? I got caught up in the whole, you know, you know I mean, you, you, you guys heard when I was speaking with DDK at the beginning, I talked about how I saw the mandate to impact people and give sight to the blind. I was a bit too fanatical about it mm -hmm. at the beginning to an extreme level such that I now didn't have time for the people that were actually closest to me, Right? And so whenever they would say things like, you give your best to the world and you give us the leftovers, I didn't understand what they were saying. I'm like, you guys should be cheering me on. You guys should be happy that I'm doing this or that I'm doing that. I didn't get it. But at some point, I think I, I, I listened to a podcast or I saw a video once that helped me understand this better. And the person who was speaking asked a question and they said, who are the top five people that will be most impacted by your death? You see, I see my, my dad passed away in 2015, December 28th, 2015, my father passed away. From that day till today, there is not a day that I haven't thought about him. Mm -hmm. Not a single day. 
in the same way, when I pass away, there are going to be a few people who will be unable to escape the memory of me. Who are those people? Those are the people that I need to focus my time, my attention, my energy on. Not on multitudes. You know, right now, multitude, they will get what they are supposed to get. The, you know, the, a portion of my time and energy is allotted to them. But I will prioritize those people that share this life with me, that share this walk with me. And they, they don't have to be a lot of people, maybe three to five people. But that is how we can somehow create that balance, right? Because people mm -hmm. like us, we get so carried away with the fame and the popularity and the charisma that we sometimes slip and just, you know, go, go into the deep end. Yes. And the people who are really successful outside are not that successful on the home front. It happens a lot of times, rep repetitively. So I think about it I, all the time. Who are the top five people who will be most impacted by my passing away? And those are the people that I, I, I truly prioritize. People who, if, I'm, if I don't want to talk to anybody in this world, I must pick up their call. I must talk with them. I must prioritize them. So it helped me um, along the way. So again, do not pour out of an empty cup. Um, 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 take care of yourself first because you cannot pour out of an empty cup and you can only truly give up your overflow. I am enjoying myself so much. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for sharing those things. And before we go into um, you know, practical strategies for building a community and um, increasing your influence and value in this decade, um, I wanted to build off of something you started to talk about, um, the mistakes you made, the challenges you faced, and how you, yeah. encounter, and how you over overcame them. And I feel it's important because we have a lot of visionaries on the call today and a lot of people who are going to be listening after this. Um, it's important for us to surface these things because we don't necessarily get opportunities as often to actually hear those practical experiences that people have had. And I hope that that's something you're open to share with us today to help one or two people who might be joining. So you shared something earlier, but what other things can you share about your own journey so far? Some of the things that if you could go back in time you will do a little bit different or some of the things you share with people right now as things to watch out for roadblocks in building a community in building out their vision in making sure that they're making an impact in this decade as you are doing right now yeah so um mistakes that i made i cannot really think um i can't really place a finger on any of them um the only one that i think was a mistake that i've shared now which is a personal one mm -hmm. Um, but it did not impact the ferocity with which I carried out my mission. Um, but it was one of it was a personal one that you know I had to take care of in my in my personal life. Um, but among things that I could have started earlier on, I think I did not understand promotions as much. So if I were to start from scratch now, there are things I would do differently. Mm -hmm. um, I started out a bit organically. Um, I mixed it with paid traffic. But if I were to start today. I will, if, and for anybody who wants to start a community, a community today, it's going to be a lot easier to start with a virtual event, right? So, with with virtual events, you know, instead of just starting a Facebook group and it's it's like house fellowship, you know, where two or three are gathered, just a few people there, they're like twenty, and everybody's seeing to the like, ah, not only us, they yo, right? And some people, some people might lose confidence because you know the community size is pretty small, but there are ways to really start with a bang. Right, and so I would advise anyone who's starting out a community today start from a platform like email, because with email you can talk to a list of 100 people as as if you're talking to a list of 10,000 people, mm -hmm. and people on the email list do not know how many other people are also on there. So you can say things like, "So one thing I always tell most of my followers is that, right, but you have only 20 people on your, 20 people on your email list." Like I say, most of my followers. <laughs> As if you have a lot of people, right? And But everybody in there, they don't know who else is there. So when you can build that email list to a critical mass, say maybe 5,000, when you launch a community, you can send out one email to that list, that engaged list. And then on your first day of launch, you have maybe, you know, 1,000 members, 2,000 members, and then you can keep on building from there, mm -hmm. right? Another thing is virtual events. So, um, I, I did my first virtual event in 2020, but if I understood virtual events earlier on, I could have started with a virtual event. So a virtual event can actually help you start with a bang, with your first like 
five to 10,000 members within a week, right? So because it's a virtual event, people, people expect to learn something huge within a finite space of time. Mm -hmm. So whatever you are into, whether you're into parenting or, or relationships or online marketing or making money online or finance, whatever it is you're into, you can create maybe the personal finance summit. You have your list of speakers, but you can say that, you know, this summit with all these speakers and with all these learnings is free, but it's going to take place in my Facebook group. Click here to join. Mm -hmm. So you'll build a list of prospective attendees. Um, Nigerians love to attend virtual events because they know they're going to learn something. It's a, it's a much more magnetic call to action than join my Facebook community. Okay, yes. what it is to do there? Are they sharing bread or buns, right? So, but when you're saying attend this virtual event, it is from this day to this day. Ah, that means if I don't attend, if I, if I don't attend from this day to this day, it's finite. I'm going to miss it. So it mm -hmm. moves them to join. What am I going to learn? I'm going to learn this from this person, this from this person, this from this person. Even this visual compass accelerate, accelerator program yeah. is like a virtual event as well. Because attendees here are going to learn from John Obidi. They are going yes. to learn from, I think I saw um, Bisola on the flyer. Yes. You know, and I saw, yeah. You know, so people who follow Bisola on social media, they are going to join this program because they know her. People who mm -hmm. follow me on social media, they will join this program because they know me. And so you can cross-pollinate audiences that quickly. So by the time this event is over, you would have had a number of people subscribe to this channel, this YouTube channel, take you up on your calls to action. And so imagine if this whole thing was trying to was it was done with a view to launch a Facebook community. In your first week, you'll be having about five thousand plus members. Of course, you've got to promote it well as well. So that's yes, how absolutely. to really start um, start with a with a bank. And that's what I would have done if I was starting afresh. But you know, I started pretty slow because I was figuring things out. And you know, but when when I figured when I figured it out, eventually things began to kick off. But you can start on a on a better footing than I did. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and from what you're saying, it's a lot of investment, it's a lot of work. Um, building a community is a lot of work and a lot goes into it. Um, and again, I still want to go to strategies, but as you're talking, more things are coming up. Um, how would you advise a visionary deciding on investing in communities using some of the strategies that you're sharing here? Because sometimes it appears that visionaries often have um, that battle between investing in their vision, you know, what it is outside of them that they are working on and investing in the growth, growth process and communities that will help grow those visions. So how would you advise someone who is a multi-influential visionary? And we talk about multi-influential flows also too in the Visionary Compass Accelerator Program on how to prioritize their resources and their investments. So... I said at the beginning that it's not the thing or the tool that you have. It is your relationship with that tool. Yes. What is that tool to you? And so if, so, you know, not only do I learn from the Bible, I learn from Greek mythology and Roman mythology as well and all kinds of history from all parts of the world. There's this, um, there's this guy named, I think his name was Perseus in uh, is it Roman or Greek mythology. They're very similar. I think it's Greek. Um, so Perseus was a Greek demigod who was supposed to, you know, complete some quests. Was supposed to go and um, kill a monster called Medusa. So in in but Medusa was this creature who would who by by staring by gazing upon you could turn the person into stone. Mm -hmm. So how was he going to accomplish this? So the gods gave him different tools. Zeus gave him a tool. Hermes gave him a bag, you know, they gave him Pegasus, the flying horse. Um, one, one of the gods gave him a shield that he could use as a mirror so he wouldn't look eye to eye with, with Medusa and all these tools, okay? So imagine maybe the gods gave him a sword, for example, and he has used the sword to win many battles. And at some point, the sword is blunt and he has a battle to fight maybe next week. How, is he going to say, ah, nobody gave me money that I use and pay the guy that helped me sharpen this sword, so I will just either do or cock and I cannot do anything. I will just... No. You know that this thing was given to you by the gods. It's a very magical sword and it needs to be on point. No matter what it's going to take, you get creative. How do I sharpen this? Because next week I have a battle and this is my magical thing. I can't use a regular sword. It's got to be this sword. This sword mm -hmm. has the magical power to kill immortal 
beings to have to sharpen it you know if they tell you that oh this sword must never touch water you will never let it touch water yeah. you see all these people that, that that they say do jazz you know i respect them so much eh, because they are the most faithful people in this world if that jazz man says that see for one year your your tongue will not touch palm oil they're not born and well touch palm oil absolutely is a christian that is so undisciplined in their life mm. yeah yeah doing 21 day fast you'll be like ah oh, Lord, the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak <laughs> ah you know god the, 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 the christian oh this is great what they give on it makes christians so undisciplined but you see jasmine they are told them if your tongue touch palm oil you will die hey they are so like they are so they are so fanatically faithful to their rituals as given to them, right? So for a visionary, what is your relationship to this thing? How fanatical about it are you? If you know that this thing is your reason for being alive, nobody will tell you that, look, I've got to invest in this thing. Absolutely. The creativity will come upon you. Personally, I had something else I was doing. I didn't have a, a business plan for my community. I didn't monetize until like nine months later. I didn't even know I could monetize it. It was nine months down the line. I was like, ah, I have like 5,000 members. So, ah, so there's money in this thing. Okay. So I now created a course. People both are like, yeah, so there's money. Okay. I started monetizing, but I didn't go into it for the money. Though you can go to it for it for the money. You ain't nothing wrong with that. But I entered this as a visionary and I was pouring money into Facebook ads. My, my, my Facebook ad copy, right. That I used that time. It was crazy. I don't know what was what what I was thinking. If I use that ad copy today, the Facebook will ban me. But that was 2016 when you know you could get away with all kinds of things. I said something very crazy. I wouldn't say that today, but back then that was my level of maturity. I said, "Stop wasting your time on Facebook. Join my Facebook community." Now <laughs> imagine seeing that as a Facebook ad. Who is this guy? What are you feeling like? What are you feeling like? Now what? <laughs> because I could see Facebook were wasting their lives. Saying crap, sharing jokes. I like to think life is a joke. Come here and learn the things that will change your life. And so in my mind, I was like, my, my Facebook ad copy then was, and I just learned how to create Facebook ads. So I, put, I created Facebook ad, I put it, I said, stop wasting your time on Facebook. Join my Facebook group. Simple. The comment section of that ad was so engaged. People were saying, oh, who be this guy? Da, da, da. But enough people were curious enough to be like, hmm, let me even join. I haven't seen Seth. They now join. Who be this one? All these young boys with pink lips, your corner, they talk. All motivational speakers. Nothing can sign me. They are saying all down, you are giving yourself homework. You are, you are burdening your head. I'm, I was a man on a mission, right? And so I'm saying that to say this. If you are truly a visionary, it's what about visionaries is that your vision will not let you sleep. It's yes. like fire in your bones. Absolutely. Only you would be able to see it. A visionary is able to go for days, weeks, and months and end without any external support. It comes from inside of you. You're like a dynamo, all right? And that's where, um, you know, I, th I think that's where um, dunamis comes from. When people refer to the spirit of God as dunamis, from a dynamo. A dynamo is a kind of device that does not need any external power source to keep on going, right? It's this perfect, you know, device that can convert the energy it's exporting into input again and it just keeps on going it doesn't need any external input it's a dynamo visionaries are like dynamos you just keep on going you go to sleep and you just wake up at 3 a.m bap idea idea anybody around you just see like a mad person what's it what's in 3 a.m what's your what's your you know i can do this thing like that and they'll be like and in your mind it makes sense you know we can do it like this and da, 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 da. and you can see all these blueprints that only you can see all right that's a true visionary and if that is who you are Nobody will tell you that you have to invest in your vision because you will not be able to sleep until this thing. Because for every, you, you, you see, there's this story of Jonah that I used to tell, you know, when I first started. I haven't told that story in, in, in a long time. The story of Jonah that we all know, Jonah was sent, you know, to go to the city of Nineveh to preach to the people there because they were sinful. And God said, you know what, if, you know, I'm going to destroy these people unless they change their ways. And so God said, Jonah, go to these people, go and preach to them. But Jonah did not believe that those guys were deserving of repentance. They're like, that, you know, these crazy people, you know, destroy them, you know. And so 
he took a vacation to Tarshish or wherever he said he was going to go. But on the way, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, there was a storm. He got thrown on into the sea. A whale swallowed him, you know, and he sat in the naughty corner for like three days and three nights thinking about what he had done, right? He was there thinking about his life, you know, and then the, the, it, it spat him out. And then he began to, you know, write all those lamentations that nobody sent him, right? Your extracurricular activities. And then finally, after much, much, he went to Nineveh and he preached to them and they were saved. Happily ever after, right? Wrong. Because Nineveh, as we know, was a commercial city. It was a fishing town. It was bordered by the waters. And back in the day, water was the only means of transport. There were no planes, you know. So if you, were, if you, were, if you, if you had a border by the sea, it was a fantastic thing because people could, ships could come there, dock, and then use donkeys or whatever to go to other landlocked countries. So people came and left Nineveh all the time. What happened to those who left town while Jonah was fooling himself? What happened to those that died while he was busy writing the Book of Lamentations? That did not send and write Book of Lamentations. They said, go to Nineveh and preach to them. Simple, simple. It's not complicated. Go here. Anything you want to do after that is your own bonus. He spent so much time. And so we learned that the vision in your heart is time-bound. It's not, okay, if I don't do it today, she will be there tomorrow. Be, you see, there are certain things connected to your vision. The moment it enters into your mind, there is somebody somewhere that has been spiritually activated to get you to step three that you cannot see yet. There's somebody waiting at step four that is surrounded by the right combination of circumstances that will be your springboard to step four. Everything has been arranged sequentially and tactically hidden from you because if you know, you will taint the process with your wasabi. The only job you are supposed to do is move now. All right. And a true visionary needs to be able to move with that fervor. You see, Jesus Christ was one of those visionaries who was willing to start even before he had honor in his hometown. And that's why he said that, you know, people misread that verse. They, they think the, the verse says that a prophet is not accepted in, in his hometown or a prophet is not honored in his own hometown. No, no. It's actually a bit more dramatic than that. He said, a prophet is not without honor. Which means that you as a visionary, as a prophet, you are always with honor. People are always honor you, except in your hometown. NIV on that interpretation says, a, a, a prophet is, 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 um, is accepted everywhere. I mean, as, a, as a visionary, everybody accepts your message. Except, it, it's a different meaning than a prophet is not accepted in his hometown. No, 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 no. A prophet is accepted everywhere. You have fans, followers, helpers, everywhere, except in your hometown. And you have to be at peace with that reality. Even the brothers of Jesus and his close relatives only came to join him at the end, at the tail end, just before the ascension and all of that. And so as a visionary, you need to be at peace with that reality. And that should not be, hey, my parents, hey, they don't support me. No, those are mortal concerns. You are not given this vision to be thinking like a mortal. No, that, those are let the mortals who don't understand the dynamics of this warfare, let them bother about these things. But you, you know the end from the beginning. You know that they will come. When they see you in newspapers, hey, Sister Amaka, ah, I saw you on channel television. Hey, we thank God, though. Hey, you know, we always knew that you were going to make, you know, you know that time in the village during last Christmas when I told you that there's something about you. There's a, I, I, I saw something in you that time is going to happen. And you just laugh. It's a human thing. All right. So visionaries, <laughs> you've got to move. The time is now. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. I'm going to remove myself from the stream. You came to see everyone on the live here. You came to see DDK and John Obidi. So and DDK you did and fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for hanging out with us um, through all, all right. of these technical issues. All right. Awesome. Did you get your Amazing. Muted? Okay, good. Cool, Amazing. <laughs> now, John, just imagine the kind of people I'm surrounded with. Look at the caliber of insights that Ife was able to pull out of you. 
you know, someone was saying to me in a, in a chat while I was sort of trying to get my internet sorted. And he was like, uh, what is it that you pull out of John? Because he's really cracking us up this night. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's the yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. the job. Yeah. You know? I, remember the, I remember the last time I was on here, too. It was a similar atmosphere. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So he was like, what are you always pulling out of John? Because he's really cracking us up. You know, yeah. and uh, a lot of powerful insights coming through because we're sharing some of the snippets. Uh, mm. That's how he was able to come over and be like, you know, John is is, is spitting fire. I mm. think a big question on my heart is sometimes visionaries face real constraints or imagine constraints that they believe are legitimate, holding them back from pursuing their vision. Now I had people, I had two persons who came into a uh, visionary compass accelerator program, which we have run into, uh, we've got, reg uh, what's it called? Applications open to, I think the 10th of July. And what they said to me at the end of the process was DDK, I had every reason not to come in than any reason to come in. But I felt this restlessness, I couldn't resist that this was time for me to take the next level or move to the next level, my vision. And that singular decision changed everything. One was talking about not having money. The other was talking about an extremely busy season in the life. So when people are saying, John, I'm faced with financial constraints, I'm faced with time constraints, I'm faced with um, maybe credibility constraints, expertise constraints. I don't feel like I have what it takes. I don't feel I have the time for it. I don't feel I have the resources for it. How did you navigate the odds that you felt were stacked against you on the path of being fanatically faithful to the vision you had seen in your heart? So you see, being a visionary is a going concern. It's, it's a very intentional journey. And mm. you cannot leave it to chance. And your belief has to be so strong so strong you know when i was a child um i mean my, my dad was a pastor so i ate i ate the bible back to back to back to back to back as a child uh, but i only understood most of this thing of those things as as a pre-adult like it's only like my in my early to mid 20s that I, I really began to understand because i was now thrown out into the world and i was forced to create meaning out of those things i learned mm. by force as a child <laughs> you know so i began to really understand those things again but when I read it as a child, when I read that if you had faith, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you know, you shall say to this mountain, be thou cast into the sea. I actually thought it was literal that Jesus Christ meant that if you have faith, you need to tell a whole mountain to be cast. That, that's not what he meant. It, it, was, it was a metaphor. So you, one cannot get so arrogant and now I go and command the whole mountain. It's you that put it there. Why do you want to remove it? Hi! <laughs> Why do you want to leave it there? Those are the laws of nature. You can leave it. Right, the mountain I talked about was a problem, some insurmountable issue, some problem, something that something that looks so immovable. But if you have faith, if you believe that it is done, if you have it like a mustard seed, and you know, when we when I also read mustard seed, we understand that the mustard seed is a very tiny seed, right? But that's not a complete story about the mustard seed because Jesus Christ went on to it to describe what a mustard seed is. That it is tiny is just one property of the mustard seed. The other property is that though it is tiny, it has this crazy growth trajectory whereby it becomes, it grows to become the largest tree in the forest. Yes. So people only take the first part most of the time that the mustard seed is tiny. So mustard seed feet, you need seed tiny. No, 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 no. That's not what it means. It means that this thing is not just tiny, but that tiny itself is deceptive. Because put it in the ground, and this thing will overtake every other plant in that in that forest or wherever I, on that garden or wherever it's it's being it's being planted, right? And so, as a visionary, that thing that was placed in your heart, you cannot just take that mustard seed and just plant it there. You have to water it. You have to mm. prune it. I don't know how many of you grew up in the villages, right? Maybe you grew up in the villages and you saw where you people, maybe your parents or people your your relatives planted yam, all right? They don't just plant them and leave it there. At times, I have to build something to protect it from goats that will come and eat it. 
And at times, those stubborn goats may try to climb over and you will carry this thing and pursue them. They'll run away. They'll still come back. you get creative. Ah, these goats have learned how to scale this thing. you build it higher, 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 higher. And every time you hear guru, 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 guru outside, you come on and check. So you're protecting it. You're protecting it. You're protecting it. All right? And what are those things? Goats are like fear. Those goats are like people that will come and say things that they know will get on your emotions. All right? Yes. Goats are like these people that, you know, they missed out on their own wave in their own time. Mm. And when they see you, they are reminded of their own failure and their own timidity. Mm. And not everybody is emotionally mature enough to see it, understand it, and deal with it in an ecological manner. They will deal with it on autopilot. And they will say things that are intended to insult you or put you down or to reduce the intensity of what you're doing. Oh, she's, uh, she's all right. Yeah, yeah, she's okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, I don't always agree with her, but, you know, you know all these but, butter people, butter, butter, but, but, butter, yeah. But, you know, she's okay. She, yeah, but, yeah, she, yeah, but, because they know that, yeah, go high, but not too high. Uh, we knew you were going to blow, but don't, don't blow that much. Calm down. Be humble. Be humble. Be humble. Yeah. You know, Nigerians, you know, a lot of Nigerians, no, not all Nigerians, but a lot of Nigerians don't really understand English, right? So they can see confidence and say, yeah, you're proud. You're proud. Yeah. Also, a lot of people have been repressed, partly due to the parenting styles of our fathers, right? So they grow up repressed. So they don't know what confidence looks like. You right? You, you know what I mean? We grow up around things like children are supposed to be seen and not heard. You know, you don't talk when your elders are talking. You don't da, da 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 You don't talk too loud. Or when you are greeting somebody, you have to be doing this one like this. And so when you who do not come from that mentality, you are expressing your gifts. You are shining. I mean, you are taking the, the, the you know, let your light so shine, so literally. They see that and they do not understand that. They're like, ah, you are proud, you are arrogant. And you, because you are not schooled in all these moral concerns, you take it personally. Like, ah, you know, I'm just, I'm proud. Does it mean I'm proud? Ah, what did I say? You mean ah, you know, da, 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 da. you can't take ad. You see, you you you. It, it, um, there's something I, I heard one time. It said, "Don't um, don't take advice from people who are not even on track in the first place." You have to understand. See, when 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 I say the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, right? It's not necessarily witches and wizards. Though. Sometimes it's words. Yes. Just like we have words of affirmation that build we have unfair criticisms words that diminish you know how many of you have experienced this i know people have experienced this before listen how many of you have experienced this when you were struggling you had like maybe 200 followers your friends with whom you had 200 followers with they were always supporting you they were put they will share you or something da, 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 da. Keep on sharing. and then one day you go into a video on channel television hmm. and then tvc and then in the space of one month, you had 50,000 followers. How many people have noticed that those your friends stop sharing your posts? Hmm. They stop liking. And I like, check them now. So, trust me, I, 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 I've lived this life. I've been here since 2013. I don't, I don't, I, I've read the book, I've written the book. So you can't even hmm. experience it. It is a predictable part of your journey. And even those your friends, they don't know the, for, the powers that work in them that is making them behave like this. It will hey. happen. But if you do not anticipate these things, it will slow you down. It mm. will blunt your blow. Right? So as a visionary, it's, see, 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 it's not Paul that said that no soldier concerns himself with civilian affairs. Mm. <laughs> you, are, you, you can't say, oh, so, oh, this was said, I'm, I'm if, any, if, if maybe GDK tells you that, okay, you are being proud, okay, then you can listen. Because you, you remember when we were kids, are you in the Lord? I mean, yeah, you speak the same language. You are all, you are all, Soldiers, right? When a civilian is telling me, what are you telling me? It's like when a king is being a king, right? A commoner will call him proud. Mm. But to another king, he's just being himself. Okay, now. A, 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 yeah, a commoner who, who does not understand that. They are used to coming into royalty and doing like this because they fear for their lives, all right? You being a king, you're just being yourself. But a commoner would say, oh, that's pride. It's pride. 
When you talk to people, you have to greet them with two hands. You have to do like this. You have to do but Don't talk too high. Bring it down small. They Don't have speak a different set unless of protocols. They have a different set of protocols and you have to anticipate this and understand mm. it with empathy that that is you, that is your journey. My wish for you above all things is that you elevate to this level. But I can't take your advice. I hear you. Fantastic. That's where you are at. But this is not, that's for you. That's not for me. All right. So that's as a visionary, you, you've got to be able to anticipate these things and understand that where you drink from is not where they drink from. Hey. Right? At a level of growth, see, listen, guys. Oh, my goodness. At a level of growth, <laughs> there are some places, some people you cannot be afford to be following. It's who you can. What are you? What are you learning from there? Now, nah, you, you. What are you learning? You are following, and they are, they are still saying the same things that you know. You know that these things that see. Listen, in this world, there are two schools, and this also comes to the place when it comes to being a visionary. You know, I always teach that there are, there are two schools. You know, people who follow me know this thing back to back. The school of the rich and the school of the poor. In this world, these are the two schools. Now. When we talk about the school of the poor, it's not, it's not about people who are dirt poor or anything. They are, it's, it's, it's people who are, you know, they, make, they, they, they are, you know, prosperous enough to afford an internet connection and view things online. So they're not that poor. Mostly middle class. There is a curriculum in life created just for them. Hmm. But there's another curriculum created for the rich. The way a person who grew up under poor parents thinks is naturally different from the one who grew up under rich parents. First of naturally. all, based on the ideology, you are no mates. One thing that really helped me in life, I made friends with people who grew up as rich kids. They taught me so many things. They helped me to be more exposed. I learned a lot by that. So when I see people on Twitter beefing rich people, that oh, the rich, the elites, why are you be talking like that? Are you not supposed to be part of the elites? Why are you divide elite and mass and then stand as masses? No. Why? <laughs> you are, why? You are elite. You are elite as well. Anyway, right? School of the rich and school of the poor. Now, in the school of the poor, there's a lot of things that they are being educated into. Now, listen. Let me let me help you understand why these two schools exist. Let me go deeper here. You may have heard this thing before. All right, that. The backbone of any economy is what? Who can answer? What's the backbone of any country's economy? Common sense. Tell me. Put in the comments. What is the Maybe backbone? Class. Middle class. Thank you. Comments, guys. Answer your comments. Participate. The backbone of every economy is the middle class. Does it make sense for any right-thinking government to reduce the number of people in the middle class no, if it's the backbone of the, the goal of any smart government is to, as much as possible, swell those numbers because they are the ones who consume. They are the ones who buy luxury goods, even though they are not rich. They are the ones who are easily manipulated into making buying decisions that they cannot quite afford. They are yes. the ones who pay the most taxes. Why are we going to create policies that make these people wealthy enough to evade taxes? Because we know that the wealthy don't pay as much tax. Because they get, mm. on a, 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 they, they get into a kind of tax bracket where they're able to pay less tax. How much, when Donald Trump finally released how much tax he paid, I, when, I, when I saw the figure, I can't remember how much it was. I can't remember how much, a billionaire. I, I can't remember how much it was, but just so I don't exaggerate, it wasn't more than $1,000. He found one loophole like that, that a middle-class person would not qualify for. And that loophole he used is still legal till today in the United States. So why would any right-thinking government intentionally make a critical mass of the people wealthy? It makes no sense. It makes no sense. What makes sense for the government? To keep you middle class. And in order to keep you middle class, it's a com it has to be a combination of policies. But policies aren't enough. Education. Oh, thank you, Oge Taiwo, 750 USD. Thank you. I didn't know the exact figure, but I knew it wasn't more than 1K. A billionaire. That's how much he paid in taxes. Anyway, no. moving on. <laughs> yeah. So it makes sense to swell the number. So it's not just policies, but education. The kind of television programming that the middle class watch is different from the kind that the wealthy class watch. The wealthy already tell their kids, no, 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 that, that's not for you. We, we don't get our news from here. We get our news from here. 
we don't get our financial needs from here, we get it from here. We don't get our needs from here, we get it from here, right? So the, from the school of the poor, you hear certain things that are being pushed that sound good, but keep them. It's like when, when for example, you see these things on Instagram that sound so good. Oh, the doors we were thrown out of. We are coming back to buy the building. What the hell, bro? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Or um, there's this thing that, that people say, oh, this, the, the sky is too wide for two birds to collide. Hmm. Now, that sounds very smart. But what is the intent of that statement? They're doing it for competition. The sky yeah. is too wide. You know, but this is where critical thinking comes in. When I was a child, I had a lot of spare time on my hands because, you know, we, we, we weren't able to afford TV and comic books that my mates could afford and all that. So I had so much spare time and so my powers of observation were heightened. And I was looking to the sky one day and I saw a big bird. I, think, I, I know what I say, a hawk or an eagle. I don't remember. It was one of these really grand birds. It was flying in the sky and I was watching it. And I, I saw one bird attack another bird on purpose. And I thought that was odd. And that's where I realized that, hold on, though they are both birds, there are some species of birds that see another species as prey. Absolutely. So though two birds cannot collide, uh, the, the sky is actually too wide for them to collide because the collision is, is accidental. The sky is definitely narrow enough for one to intentionally hunt down another one and eat oh, it good. and give food to yes. its children. And so while the school of the poor gives you that half-baked wisdom, you see somebody who, you know, God has laid a trade secret in your heart in the dead of the night. The next morning you're on Instagram saying, yes, so, in the, so 10 ways to, no, it's not for them. It was for you. That was your breakthrough. That's why Jesus Christ said the children of the world are wiser in their dealings wiser. than those of the kingdom. Because once this thing goes to a worldly person, they are first going to patent it, trademark, getting lawyers to ironclad it because they were like, you know what? If it be this one, this might be it. Next thing they have, they're getting a pitch deck. Next thing, visas are coming. The school of the rich knows the blueprints. For the school of the poor, the whole thing God gave you lives and dies. <laughs> In one online course. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> I have to drop it like that because I too put out online courses. Ain't nothing wrong with that. But there's a spirit of discernment that will come upon you when you know that this one was not is not for them. This is for me. What is the path to exploding this thing? There is a defining moment being stirred up by this idea. And I need superior wisdom with which to handle this. You see, at times, Christians like to whitewash Jesus Christ and give him an identity that he never said he was in the first place. You just want to create something, right? There's this parable where he was talking about the, the shrewd manager, right? Don't judge the story with your eye because you want to see Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is holy. Just read what was there. Don't add or remove. Read what was there. You ever told the parable of this guy who he heard, actually he had been unfaithful. He had been dishonest. And the master knew he was dishonest and was going to fire him. Now, he knew that the master was going to fire him. So he began to go to, to the, the master's uh, debtors to cancel their debts or drastically reduce them so that he would be found in their favor when he was eventually fired. That is fraudulent. Now, this, this did not really happen. It was a parable. And a parable is, a, is an allegory, a story that was created, maybe spontaneously, to drive a certain message across. Now, the way Jesus Christ ended this parable was that the master praised this guy. Why would Jesus say that? Why would he make up a story that talked about the master praise? Why did the master not get angry? Remember, Jesus Christ was the architect of the story. That's why it's a parable. He made it up to pass a point. Why would his story end up with the master praising this guy instead of throwing him to where there is whipping and gnashing of teeth as usual? <laughs> why and at the end of it he said the children of this world are wiser in their dealings than those of the kingdom and then at some point he said something like you have to be what as innocent as doves as harmless as doves but also as wise 
as serpents. Most Christians have been churched into being as innocent and harmless as doves. No one has taught them to be wise as serpents. Nobody. And so you are prey. You are prey. The wealthy man who grew up with a serpentine wisdom will come and who will just see your Instagram live. Wow, fantastic. He has made notes. Boom. Billion dollar idea. Gone. Mm. He'll just see you. Watch on YouTube. Wow, interesting. Nice nuggets. Bam. He will copyright it. Peter it gives his own spin. Boom. He has gone. All right. <laughs> so I don't know why I went on this trajectory, but I just thought you guys had to hear it. All right. So this is I know I say, there are two schools in this world the school of the poor and the school of the rich. All right. Just as right here, there's also the school of the commoner and the school of the visionary. Visionaries drink from a very different well visionaries draw so from a very different store so, store so so where you have something like like the, the the visionary compass academy program is not something that you, it's not it's not normal oh check maybe i can learn it on youtube maybe i can go online mm -hmm. and find one book uh, three three steps to achieving your vision maybe i can just mm -hmm. go and google you cannot google it no no you, if you are coming to to this program or any of ddk's programs you are coming to draw from the well of a visionary not a commoner. You have no business taking advice of a commoner. Your parents love you. Mm. They nurtured you. But there's nothing they can tell you about being a visionary. If they are not visionaries themselves, you've got to come oh, and no. drink from the pool of visionaries. So do not take programs like this for granted. This is not something you, you, you look at what we are talking about. You can't go on YouTube and find something that is so tailored to your present travails. You cannot mm. Google these things. We are basically telling you your future so that you can anticipate. Literally. Tony Robbins said one thing, <laughs> okay? well, Tony Robbins said one thing that lo losers react, winners anticipate. We are saying people who hey. have gone, we are giving people who have gone the way, and I tell you, see, at mile two, you face this, do this. At mile three, you face this, do this. And so this is what programs like this are for. You're the school of the common man and the school of the visionary. So I don't have to tell you guys which school you have to subscribe to. The Visionary Compass Amazing. Accelerator Program. <laughs> wow. <laughs> John, I have a question that is not a question like that. It's almost like um, just getting a sense of what your preference is between something and something. And that's my final question for you. But before that, I want to just take a moment to salute all our uh alumni class of 2021 on the call so let me know just do your hashtag vcap class of 2021 i salute you it was 40 weeks now john this is like a year-long coaching and mentorship immersion and i commend you know the hard work that you put into the program what i think really really blows my mind about visionary compass accelerator program it's not just the core curriculum, which is eight modules uh, broken into weekly subtracts. That's about 32 right there. It's the execution blueprint. John, we've got this thing going that every single visionary who interacts with it say, this is pure gold, DDK. It's pure gold. Now, based on your mastery level, because we find that the first miracle that you can create for a visionary is to help them know what their mastery level is. We sometimes teach visionary excellence and execution in a blanket way. Go do these, these, and these. But if you are not at the level where you should be scaling your vision and you are at the level where, where you should be launching, what you need to do specifically is different. If you are at the level where you should be clarifying it and you just want to be super crystal clear how you should move and what's your go-to market strategy, it's different what you should be learning, etc. So for each of the mastery levels, and we, we use an assessment to really uncover where you are exactly based on the set of parameters, you've got this blueprint that shows you what you can do over the course of the next one to two years that can help you hit huge targets with your goals and with your vision. And it's breathtaking. I think the third exciting thing for me would be the community. And it's, it's what we've been speaking to tonight. I feel like the miracle also is in the moment you start to roll with a certain caliber of people, there will be some things you won't read in a book, but you are going to catch by osmosis. You, you're just going to catch it 
by being in the same space with people like that, and it just propels you absolutely to the next level. And I mean, there are just so many great things about the accelerator program. We've extended uh, enrollments, and we're now closing on the 10th of July. But you know, you have to apply, and that takes you know some time for you to be screened, for the jury to give you feedback. It's just powerful what goes in there. So use the link. We are waiting to welcome you, and all our 50 plus you know previous graduates are going to be able to support you when you get into the program as well. My question to you, John, and I know this question can take you to a place where we won't even leave tonight, but I'm looking for the toast version, the crash course uh, version of it. Uh -huh. What would you describe as your favorite door opener into global opportunities, especially okay. for a person who doesn't feel like I'm ready to necessarily step out of my country. There are people, because we're experiencing these visionary transitions, where God by himself is creating this exodus of visionaries from base to other parts yes. of the world. Yes. Unless a person believes that I'm meant to be here, this is my base at this time. What are the biggest door openers that you love and you found to be your favorites for giving you access as a visionary to the global stage? Okay, so first of all, guys, if you are here, there's something I like to do on my, on my broadcast. I like to tell people that they need to pepper their enemies. So if you are here watching this on YouTube, there are other people who are busy watching TV and wiring away their time. I want you guys to make a screenshot of what you're viewing right now and post on your Instagram story, tag DDK, tag now. Visionary Compass Accelerator Program, tag John Obidi, put it on your Instagram stories and type I'm what you are going to see. Hype it, hype it, put Put salt and pepper, spice, spice up it. that post. You understand? Spice it up. Yeah. Let people feel like they are missing out. Hey, how did I miss? It? No, whenever we finish such things, I was in, hey, where was I? How did I miss it? I wanted to pepper them. Right. So make screenshots, post it, tag us. We're going to repost. Let people know that they are missing out on something here. All right. <laughs> Dorothy said you make me. You made me look at the sky. Yes. So you reached to look up. All right. Fantastic. Okay. So DK's question was. Um, what has been my favorite door opener? Um, so for people who want to be, who have to be in one place and want to spread out their message, my favorite door opener has been technology-wise podcasts or, or virtual summits, right? And the easiest way is to cross-pollinate audiences with someone who is in another country. But the best way to do that is to build a critical mass of following in your home country, right? Because, you know, when people invite people to, to come on their programs, they tend to do it like a charity thing. Oh, please come. You know, you have the chance to come and inspire people. Da, da, da. Boring. <laughs> Very boring <laughs> value <laughs> proposition. Right? Yeah, money is probably in my country, right? But where you make it appear like a media opportunity, it gets more interesting. So if I come on your platform, how many more people will I be exposed to, right? Do you have the promotional muscle to make this worth my while in terms of eyeballs and people who might come over to my own platform, subscribe, take me up on, on my own programs, and so on, right? So one of my major... Um, door openers is I've been, you know, to build up my community, build up the numbers, the engagement and the numbers, and then using that as a power base to invite other people who have other strong power bases. So when I invite them mm -hmm. in my pitch, I mean, not that you know, people kind of know my name, but back when nobody knew my name, I had to include the size of my community in that pitch. We're a community of over whatever number, even like when we're 50,000 50, members, community of over 50,000 members. And they'll be like, so it became a media, like a media opportunity. And so they would come on, and then people who you know are in their circles would come onto our program, they would see what we're doing, they would follow, and so it would it would would cross-pollinate audiences like that. So that was locally, internationally, we like to do the same thing. So there, when at a time, you know, in history where it is kind of getting cool to be African, 
or to connect to Africa. And I think it was catalyzed by the Black Panther movie. And so a lot of, you know, people over the world began to like, you know, do the, you know, imagine the whole, the whole Wakanda thing. You know, some people actually think Wakanda is real. I was shocked when I realized that. Of, co of course. <laughs> yeah, like a, it was a conversation starter for at least yeah. a year for me, everywhere I went. You know, yeah, people <laughs> think it's real, yes. Yeah. So people don't realize that but, you know, it's just a Marvel movie, but okay, cool. But it made a lot of people want to connect to Africa. And, it's a lot, and this is a time where a lot of people all over the world from different cultures want to connect to Africa. And so you've got to be positioned as someone who is an authority and a leader in any civilization. Leaders are treated differently than regular citizens. Leaders are always treated differently. You know, when the Russia-Ukraine thing broke out and President Zelensky got on TV and you know, was talking to people to come help fight for Ukraine, do this, do that. And my man, I was like, mm, okay, I hear you. All, but is it for you to say? Because no matter what happens, he will not be touched. Based on international agreements. Do your whatever, but you cannot touch him. It's just I, 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 common decency and, you know, the rules of engagement in 21st century. People don't do that anymore, right? Even in the Nigerian political space, right? You know, you don't typically hear of high-profile assassinations anymore. They don't do that. They can banter, they can do that, but they do not. The last time such never happened was a lot of long time ago. They don't really do that again. Yeah. The people that are casualties are the foot soldiers. Yes. Those that are unable to discern, ah, no, this is not, this is my boundary. <laughs> Let me know. They will just run into it, you know. But on the highest level of leadership, they do they have lines that they do not cross. So leaders are always treated differently. Treated differently. So, you have mm. to be positioned as a leader, right? So At the beginning, somebody asked a question here that how can I figure out the best communities to join? I was like, I answered the question, but I was like, that's the right question for this platform. We are trying to be leaders, not followers here. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. When we're talking to followers, there's a, there's a platform for that. But here we're raising visionaries and leaders. So you should be asking me how to create your own community, not how to join somebody else's own. I mean, I, I don't mind joining my community and all that, but that's not why we are here. We're here to teach you how to create your own movement, not to be a follower, but how to be a leader, because leaders are always treated differently. So I, I said that to say this, that you have to be recognized as a leader of a critical mass of people that trust your word, the whole science of building trust is a different conversation, but you need to have that critical mass. Like, how many eyeballs can you guarantee me? If I come on your platform now, right? I'm the biggest deal in South Africa or in Uganda. But if I come on your platform now, how many eyeballs can you guarantee me? Now, they will not ask you this question in English. They will not even ask you verbally, but they will think it. It is up to you to anticipate that mental question and answer it even if they will never ask it in your pitch. We have, we have a community. I am the admin of a community of X, Y, Z number of people grow it to be big. And, you know, we have a feature on this, 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 this. And by coming on here, you are going to have this opportunity, that opportunity, that opportunity. We have a buying audience that typically buy um, knowledge-based products. And this would be a great opportunity for you to showcase your work to a new market. Who will not say yes? Who? <laughs> right? Ah, did it get frozen? All this time, I thought she was just looking at me and immersed in what I was saying. All right, she's frozen, but let me continue. So she gets back. Maybe if, if, if air is around, if air can come and just substitute in the meantime. Okay. So, so um, um, what, what was that? I was on the train of thought now, and I just, I, I kind of just veered off when, when the decay was not there anymore. Um, I really almost forgot. I'll, I'll get it back. If you remember, I put it there. Yes, leaders are treated differently. So you have to position yourself as a leader and then use that to cross-pollinate audiences. When you invite them over to your platform, it is natural reciprocity that they would invite you over to their platforms and you would be able to expose yourself to international audiences and you can go global without even leaving Nigeria, okay? But you have to play the game as a leader, all right? So um, that's about it for those who want to go global or international. Uh, but 
are in Nigeria and figuring out how to do it. You know, the, I think the pandemic was a fantastic reset and it just helped people to figure out a way to use the internet to make all these connections. So this is the best time to be alive. And this is basically the blueprint. Okay, Ife. Awesome. All right. One question that I had in mind as you and DDK were talking, um, and I hope she's back soon, is um, I was writing this morning, at, uh, just wanted to share a couple of things with friends and saying that the problems that we will face in the next 10 years, even five years, is going to be vastly different um, from what we are facing right now. The world that will be in the next couple of years is going to be way different. It's not going to re resemble what we're in right now. And the pandemic, like you're just talking about, um, is a very good example that has illustrated what it, what that possibility looks like, a rapidly changing world, the possibility of a rapidly changing world. So how can a visionary position themselves or how are you positioning yourself as, you know, this thought leader, you're leading a community of, grow a very growing community of close to 200,000 people now, which is continuing to grow and will continue to grow as time goes on and as these challenges um, surface and change. How are you positioning yourself to be able to provide answers that are not of this world in that sense to those evolving, um, metastasizing problems that you know we're continuing to face in the world? Right. So you've got to intentionally grow yourself, mm -hmm. and that involves reading books leaning not on your own understanding alone, but on the lived experiences of other people. If, and, and again, a, doing a community is first about leadership. Yes. So first things first, you've got to learn about leadership. I have to read books on leadership so I could grow my leadership, my leadership capacity. And then um, other things began to come in, come in there before I could figure out the tech and all that. I first had to understand the leadership. Of course, it's a going concern. You never stop learning. But first, leadership. Then, you, of course, you have to grow yourself. You have to read books. And you have to be someone who is able to create some kind of mental space to think about, to think deeply about everything you hear, everything you read. And, you know, like we say, like I like to say, wisdom is the capacity to create meaning or to, to weave a web of meaning. Mm -hmm. So you saw something in traffic today or on TV today. What is the meaning you can weave out of this, right? And so your time alone, most times, will be dedicated to, to thinking and creating these solutions that people may be having, right? If you look at the, the, the life of Jesus, he was always alone. He tried as much as possible to be alone. You know, at times when he would just borrow Peter's boat, he would go into the water because on land, there are too many people who would go to the water and be on his own. There was a time when he was in the boat with them and he wanted to be alone so bad that he began to walk on the water and he, and he just kept on going like that because he wanted to be alone. So, so that, that, that alone time is, is, your, is your hour of power yes. and it's your time where you create your bodies of knowledge that when you come on platforms like this and you're just spinning fire, everybody's like, wow. But, you know, like Tony Robbins said, private, no, not Tony Robbins, it's uh, Jim Rohn. No, um, the guy who wrote Seven Habits, um, um, what's his name? Stephen. Um, is it Stephen Covey? Covey. Yes. yes, thank you. Stephen Covey. He said, private victories precede public victories. Mm -hmm. Private victories precede public victories. So what you win in, how you win in private will determine how you win in public. So what you study, then Tony Robbins said something that is similar. He said, people are often rewarded in public for what they practice for years in private. Right. When I first started my journey a long time ago, I would borrow a friend's camcorder and I would pre I would I would practice presenting in front of camera because it's different from presenting in person. You've got to learn how to be animated and architect your body language to this inanimate object called a camera, as though you are in front of a lot of people. I had to relearn that, or rather, I did that continually. You know, until I could bring that same energy to my online broadcasts as I could in real life, right? So everything I practiced in private came out in public. I learned how to write. In private, I would write, 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 and write, learn how to refine my thoughts in writing. And then when I write something that's valuable out there, people are like, wow, amazing. But people are rewarded in public 
for what they practice for years in private. Private victories precede public victories. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And as we start to wrap up, I want to say thank you so much for giving us your time today. This has been an amazing session. Um, I also want to say to the audience, please share your questions in the chat. We have a couple of minutes um, before we close today's broadcast to answer any direct questions that you have for him. This is your opportunity, so please take it. Um, <laughs> so uh, multiplying your value in the 21st century through community um, communities. John Obili, what final words would you have for visionary leaders who are joining today's broadcast and listening to you? Yeah, guys, so this has just been like a taster, all right? You know, when you go and buy suya and they'll give you something to just taste, yeah? This is the small taste they were giving you of what DDK has in store in the Visionary Compass Accelerator program. I think yes. someone put out the URL somewhere in, in the comments. Okay, it's, yes. I think it's scrolling. Yes. So the Visionary Compass um, is a 40-week comprehensive coaching and mentoring program by DDK. And that is the well that you are going to be drawing from for the next one year as a visionary leader, as a person who... I mean, look at the, 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 the naming, Visionary Compass. What is a compass? A compass is something that gives direction. When you are lost, a compass helps you with what? Course correction. And so if you are someone who wants to start out on the right foot with your vision, with that thing that God has placed in your heart and says you have to do, but you don't know how, the Visionary Compass Academy program um, the Visionary Compass Accelerator pro program is yes. the program for you. So click on the link there. It's myvisionarycompass.com. Read what's on there, and I can guarantee you that you're going to give fantastic value. I've seen a lot in the program from those who have graduated from it. Um, those guys, when they come out, there's a certain elegance about them. Absolutely. There's a depth about them. There's a sense of conviction with which they project their message, and not just conviction, but intentionality of purpose and clarity. So if you want that to be your lot, check out the Visionary Compass now. Um, go to the URL, click it, and I know that um, you are guaranteed to get what you're looking for. Thank you so much, John. I have one question here that I'm going to spotlight. Um, let's see. OK, Oluwadara Simi says, what's your take on starting a paid community? Is it advisable? Oh, yes. I mean, paid communities work, um, but you've got to figure out where that fits into your overall strategy. Mm -hmm. If you are new to the market, I don't know how a paid community would fly unless people have had an opportunity to, you know, get a taste of what value you represent. And so some ways of giving people a taste is by either expressing your gifts on a podcast, on a YouTube channel or through a blog. Or, yeah, and, and I think that the best way for people to actually get to experience you is through videos like this, live broadcasts or YouTube videos or podcasts. There's a way that people experience you when they can hear you than when they just read your writing. There's a way your voice is able to influence them and change mm -hmm. their lives that when you mention that you have a paid community, they're sold because you're like, mm -hmm. you know what, like, like, you know, like, like in the days of Jesus, like, there was, you know, we felt like fire, there was fire in our bones when this person was speaking. This person is the person for me. Whatever he or she is selling, I am sold before they even mention it, right? And so, and so a, a, a platform where you can give people a taste of what to expect would help you upsell them into the paid community. That works, but you've got to create that platform where people can experience mm -hmm. you. Thank you. And I'll take about two more questions before we wrap up. We already talked about how you expand, um, you know, how you select things to learn um, and, you know, how you make uh, room for that in your life too. But I think this person is more interested in how you make that selection. So what goes into it? So this is from Moses. How do you select your books to read, your, document uh, your documentaries to watch, and so on and so forth? Right. So Bob Marley once said that when you know where you're coming from, you will know where you are going. Now, I don't know how that works literally, but metaphorically, it makes some sense. And it, it just means that the past has a lot to teach us about the future. King Solomon wrote that what has been will be again. There is nothing new under the sun. It says, can anybody point at something and say, oh, this thing is new? 
No, it was already existing long before our time. So what has been will be again. And that is why it is important if you are going to be a visionary, if you are going to be wise and full of wisdom, it is important that you be a student of history. So one thing that I love is reading about history. But there's so much in history, world history, political history, economic history, that teaches us about the future. Mm -hmm. And we even have something in, I think, statistics that is called regressional analysis. Regressional analysis is where you go back into patterns of the past and use that to inform future trends and the decisions that we make based on our anticipation of those future trends. If you look at Jesus all the time, before he went into his ministry, he was well versed on the Old Testament. He knew everything about Moses, everything about David. So when the fire sees are coming with one, he is giving them two. The Pharisees will say, ah, why are you calling yourself the son of God? Jesus said, hey, your hero, David, he wrote that ye are gods. Now, he wrote that you people are gods. I didn't say I'm God, though. I said I'm the son of God. What is your problem, right? Mm -hmm. If he did not have a core knowledge of the past, that is the Old Testament, he would not have been able to have those witty responses, right? And so your ability to create that, those, that body of knowledge will come from your knowledge of history. So what I like to read is history, political history, mm -hmm know the history of Nigeria, know the history of the world, understand how democracy came to be. How can you, you everybody just, just run and get your PVC, get your PVC, zeal without knowledge. What is democracy in the first place? How did democracy come to be? The first civilizations to practice democracy, what was it like? What was the thoughts that was put into it first? Was it the Romans? Was it the Greeks? Go and find a documentary on that and be more informed. If you are a student of that that I just mentioned now, there is nothing that is happening even in the Nigerian political landscape that will surprise you. Olakule well, Shoryo once said that uh, new experiences are actually old experiences happening to new people. It's not new. It's been happening. You are just new to the show, right? And so people have to be students of history. Learn. Give yourself to learning. These things are things that are boring to pedestrians, to commoners. Because everybody is chasing five steps to becoming a millionaire, ten steps to blow to to uh, to be to blow on to blowing up in 2022, five ways to no, right? For your wisdom to be complete, you've got to be a student of history, and you've got to be able to study in what we call first principles. Different sermon, but be, but be a good student of history. Thank you, John Bidi. Do you have questions? Do you have time for three more questions? Because okay. <laughs> they're coming in. Okay, okay. great. Excellent says, um, how do I go about building teams? Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. How do I convince people to follow? Well, I think that if you want to use the Jesus analogy, he actually recruited people based on their ability. Mm. You know, there's, <laughs> there's this thing that is very popular in, 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 you know, amongst Christians. They say this thing when they say from the pulpit that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. Lazy people like that saying, hey, just say it like this. All the unqualified people will jump and be rejoicing. Yay! <laughs> God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the call. Hey! All the unqualified people will in their hands. Right? Yoshi. Right? Go and study to show yourself approved. Right? Because when Jesus was starting out in ministry, he called people according to various areas of specialization all right yeah. the tax collector he had a thing for numbers um peter he had a boat he understood how to fish there's something in peter's history that empowered him for what he was about to do even the apostle paul was not chosen just by accident right i keep asking people this trick question and very few people are able to answer me because they just give me christianese i asked them this question why was the apostle paul one of the most influential people in the New Testament, even though he never met Jesus Christ in person. Why? Mm -hmm. People give me many Christianese answers. Okay, he never married, or it was grace, or yada, yada, yada. The answer is right there in front of you. What was the answer? He had mm -hmm. two passports, dual citizenship. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Romans, and it's there in your Bible, it's not me, I'm, I, I'm not making yeah. things up. Yeah. When now Peter was and um, Paul was both a Jew and a Roman, 
Now, when they called, when, when Peter was arrested, the centurion or the leader, the Roman guy said, who's this guy, Paul? What did he do? We don't know what he did. Take him to that corner and whip him first while we're figuring out what he did. When I read it, I was like, is that how you just are so sav we're so savage in those periods? Like, you don't know what he did. They said, just whip him, you know, while we are figuring out what he did. And then Paul spoke and said, is it lawful for you to whip a Roman, not 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 for you to whip a man. If you're a regular human mm -hmm. being, then they will, they will do you anyhow. Is it lawful for you to whip a Roman citizen who has not yet been found guilty of a crime? Mm -hmm. And he said that the centurion was shocked. He said, are you really a Roman citizen? And Peter said, yes. And he called for the soldiers to uncuff him. From that moment, Paul was treated with dignity. And they had a rapport. The centurion said, oh, I too am a, I'm a Roman citizen, but I bought my own with a lot of money. Paul said, nice story, bro. I was born a citizen. And from that moment, Paul was treated with certain decencies that regular prisoners were not treated to. As a Jew, in those times, they were the least in the pecking order. They were the most persecuted group of people in the world at the time. We've got to realize the context there because at that time they were being colonized by the Romans. Mm -hmm. That's what they did to Jesus Christ now. So what happened to Peter? They all died where they... Paul had multiple opportunities to be free. He just decided not to go. If you read where he actually was being tried, he was being treated with so much leniency. The leader would be like, I want to let you go. Just stop talking about this whole Jesus thing. What's your problem? You are a Roman. Just go free. What's your problem? All right? Which kind of prisoner? would be locked up in a cell, but they give him writing materials, he writing letters to which Corinthian church and which Philippian. And, they, and he even has messengers that will come and help him be delivered. He was a VIP prisoner. <laughs> he was a VIP. So he could go to places based on that privilege that regular Jews like Peter, John, and those guys could not go to. So that was based on capacity, right? So back mm -hmm. to building teams. When you start, there's a lot of people that are going to be like, oh, I want to give to you. I want to help you. Da, 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 da. It's very important that you pick people according, not just based on their availability, but according to skill. Mm -hmm. Even when Jesus was given the parable of the um, talents, he said the, man, the, the rich man gave them talents according to their abilities. Yes. To one, he gave five. To one, he gave two. To one, he gave one. You know, they're not talking as, oh, we are all equal in the sight of God. We made that thing up, right? People have different capacities, and God entrusts certain visions to these people based on these time-tested capacities. To one, he gave five. To one, he gave two. And to one, well, he gave one. All right? So when you're picking, you need to have that discernment and that wisdom to pick people, yes, they are available, but they've got to be actually based on their competencies. Okay, how you pick based on competencies is a whole different ball game. It's a whole different sermon, but we've got to put that front and center in your mind. I have one from Intentional Living with Meb. It says, do you have a word of counsel for them? They're at a stage of building followers, and it can sometimes be lonely and discouraging. What would you say to someone who's feeling those emotions right now? So I think that this replay is going to be on. I actually mentioned that somewhere at the beginning. So maybe you weren't yeah. here at the beginning. You just got in. So just watch the replay. There's somewhere where I mentioned, um, you know, that visionaries drink from a very different pool than commoners. Uh, being lonely at the beginning of the journey is an essential part of it. This is an essential part of any visionary's journey. You've got to get comfortable with it and move on to the next stage. But to listen, listen to where I focused on that for about 30 minutes, just rewind when you're done with this and you'll get to that part where I mentioned that, all right? Okay, thank you. And yeah. one more, I am Olive says, um, this really just talks about your personal network of people. How do you make friends that think the way you do? Um, I feel most of my friends are not relating to the way I think and I feel I am alone in this journey. What advice can you give me? We talked about this actually, I think it was in the second pivot conversations, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. That's why it's very important to let your light so shine among before who? Before God? No. Before who? Men and women. Right? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good mind. 
intentions, your good hearts, no, your work, that they may see your good works, and they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. But you have to shine. The, the benefit, one benefit of shining your light, creating your platform, being loud with your message, is that light recognizes light. At this stage in your life, you're still comfortable having those friends around base and availability, even though you have a lot of people around you, but you still feel alone in your journey because you guys are of different ideologies. The, the minute you start to shine your light, people who think like you will begin to gravitate towards you. And you guys will begin to form these friendships, bonds, and associations based on common wisdom, common understanding, and a common path, right? And so I think someone said that a, a common past is good, but a common destiny is better. But people would not know where, what your path is like, where your path is leading, if you do not let that light shine. But it's when that light shines, that someone will be like, oh, this person is just like me. Let me go say hi. And then you start having people amongst whom you can commune. I mean, there was a time in my life when I did not know who DDK was. Does that mean DDK too did not know who John Abidi was? But somehow DDK is on her own there. You know, doing her thing loud and 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 loud and and um, and effective. I'm on my own doing my thing loud and effective. And somehow, John Obidi on this side sports DDK, DDK sports John Obidi, and then we connect. Yes. That's the story of how most of us connect. But if we were all in our silos, speaking in hush, 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 hush tones, we would never have met. So mm -hmm. the the secrets to making those kinds of friends and connections is by letting your light shine, so they can see you, and their, their, their light too is shining you will also see them. I hope that helped you. Um, I am Olive. And the last one for tonight, Japheth here says, what is the best way to see your innovative ideas and know what to put into action first? Well, I think this comes with practice. It's very important to have an orderly mind, right? It's very, the, the people who say this thing as a thing of, you know, my, my mind is just scattered. I'm just, my mind is just scattered. I don't know, no, 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 no. It's not okay, all right? you can learn how to have an orderly mind. And that is why writing is like therapy. Because writing helps you to order your thoughts. Because when you first start writing, you realize how scattered your thoughts are at first. When you put on paper, you'll be like, whoa, <laughs> this is crap. <laughs> this line doesn't belong here. This paragraph doesn't belong here. And that's okay. But over time, that writing exercise will help you to arrange your thoughts. And then when you learn how to arrange your thoughts in writing, you will know how to chronologically arrange your ideas, which idea comes before this, what step comes before that. You must learn to have an orderly mind. And one of those ways is through the therapy of writing. I think you're muted again. My goodness, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Mr. John Obidi, <laughs> this was a powerful session. Thank you so much from all of us at the Visionary Compass Accelerator Thank Program from DDK. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to crave your indulgence for just one more second um, and use this to announce the scholarship winners um, of the first round of our scholarship contest at Deyemi Toluakemi Tejumo Jesu Oluwaremi. Oluremi rather, Feyisha Yokola Sanusi, Oluwa Tomisi David, Okori Chisom Victory, um, Akishi Yojo Olu Busola and Olubuji Yetunde. Congratulations, you made it through. You are now um, enrolled in the Visionary Compass Accelerator program. We were impressed and inspired by the level of clarity that you brought to your vision or to your to the scholarship su submission. And we look forward to partnering with you in implementing your journey so that you can make an impact in this decade. Once again, congratulations. And I just wanted to note that this is just the first round um, of our scholarship contest. We still have a second batch coming on, and then we will also announce win winners of the Founders Scholarship very soon. So please look out closely for our emails and follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. And we will share all of those with you once um, We'll share that information with you once it's available. So once again, um, I want to thank you, John Obidi, for giving us your time. This has been an amazing session. 
Thank you so much. And um, let's appreciate it. Oh, uh, <laughs> we already have people um, appreciating you in the chat. Thank you so much. We really love this time. Whenever and I did, whenever I did the K calls, I must answer. Absolutely. <laughs> I must answer. <laughs> absolutely. All right. I hope everyone here has a wonderful afternoon, night, wherever you're joining us from around the world. It has been an amazing session. And to our audience, thank you so much for honoring us with your time. We do not take this for granted. And we will see you on the other end. Bye, everyone.